Hey everybody, David Costello here, founder and CEO of Jetpack Workflow and host of Growing Your Firm Podcast. Today's guest is David Jennings. He's the author of Systemology, host of the Business System Simplified Podcast. He also is the owner of SystemHub.com. And before this interview, we're talking and what he does, or what he's done in the past, he doesn't do it anymore because he got so booked out. But what he's done in the past is he would help you know certain accounting firms, bookkeeping firms, really build systems in their firm. And, and I know for some, that's really daunting. It's really scary. They're not sure how to quickly and easily and efficiently build out their process, build out their system in a way that doesn't maybe require all of their time to do so. So we're going to dig into a case study today. If you're watching this, which I recommend also watching it, we're going to dig into his client flow. I maybe butchered the name, but he'll get the name right in a second. But all that to say, I'm excited for David to be on. David, welcome to the show. Fantastic. Thank you for the invite. And same, very much looking forward to the episode. Yeah, well, you're my Australian brother. We're wearing the same outfit. So uh, it's the black t-shirt day here at the Growing Your Firm podcast. So that's really exciting. I did not tell you to do that. So we just had, <laughs> we we're on the same frequency today. and We knew it was going to be the black t-shirt day. So that's pretty cool. So um, David, I'm really excited to dig in. I know you're the systems guy. And uh, I, you know, the first thing I want to talk about is what We'll, we'll, we'll dissect the firm here in a second, but like why systems in the first place? Like why this geeky endeavor to that like goes so, so deep into systems and processes and checklists and things like that. Uh, the main reason being, I just see it as a, a huge problem in the world that I want to go out there and solve. So the idea of building businesses that work without the business owners that are scalable and that aren't person dependent uh, and, that create something that solves this specific problem because there is work out there that talks to things like systemization you think of six sigma and lean but a lot of the methodologies that are out there are really focused on larger companies and they're epically overkill for small and medium-sized businesses and i feel like you know i, I read the books i did the e-myth and traction and built to sell and scaling up like there's a lot of books that talk to the idea and the importance of systems but i always felt like something was missing i got all excited after reading the e-myth thinking yeah i'm going to systemize my business i'm going to make it like mcdonald's and then i kind of go oh okay but where do i start what systems need to come first and uh, how do i get my team involved and i had a lot of baggage as well around the systemization i uh, for some reason, I thought if I systemize my business too much, I'm going to remove the creativity. And I thought if I um, create systems, my team aren't going to follow the systems anyway. So why should I bother? And I thought that I would have to be the one that creates all the systems. So I just, I felt like a lot of things had stopped me and trapped me in my business for years. And then I started to test those assumptions and go, hang on, a lot of these things I've just made up or I've just jumped to those conclusions and um, then, then once I managed to systemize my business and step out, step out of the operations, that's when I thought, hang on, this is a huge problem for business owners and it's so poorly explained and uh, that, that was what really led to the development of systemology. Yeah, perfect. Um, well, and, 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 yeah, obviously I buy into it, but I do think there's a real fear of like you will lose that creativity and a lot of accounting firm owners, they don't think of the word creativity, but that's really what it is. You know, creativity in how you approach clients, creativity in how you market creativity and like how you answer the phone or respond back to clients. Like, again, we don't really view that as being creative, but it is. And you can kind of interchange creativity with control, right? You might be giving up control when you have a system versus doing things your own way. Um, but I think there's a lot to it if you're trying to drive yourself to a place of freedom. Um, so let's, let's walk through you, you, you I, I might, let's walk through. I, I, uh, sorry, go ahead. I was keen to speak just to that one point as well, because the more that I've dug into it, the, the more that I've realized that it's actually a myth and a misconception that it will remove that creativity or remove that control. Cause what it actually does, you create systems in place and it gets all of the parts of the business handled that need to be handled. You do need to follow up when a lead comes in. You do need to onboard them into your project management platform when you're about to start work with them. And there are certain ways of doing things that just need to be done. If you do that first, and you know maybe there's a certain way that you extract data from MYOB or Zero 
if you have a system for the way that that's done, that then frees you up or your team members up to then start to do your best work and mm -hmm. be creative. Cause you don't have to think about all the little things you can now go, great. I've got everything set up. I can dive into the numbers and do my analysis free of thinking, Oh, did, did I ask the client for this and that, you know, do I have the right logins for that? And do I have the contact person? Cause it was just part of your onboarding system. So th there is a real misconception that it actually gives you more control and gives you more freedom by having these processes in place. 100% agree. Um, so let's make systems approachable for everybody. Uh, let's walk through, you mentioned a firm uh, that you'd worked with in the past and it was a sizable firm and it was a department in the firm. So let's, let's kick it off. So who, give us an example of maybe a firm that you've helped uh, in the past and what was their firm profile when you, when you came in? initially. Mm. So the company that I'm thinking of is Mulcani and Co. It's an Australian based company that uh, works in uh, regional Victoria and they help farmers get their head around books and sort of manage their farms and things like that. Now that was at least the division that I worked with. They do have a multiple divisions that deal with different types of businesses at different levels. But this one group, the department head kind of recognized a problem. They had, had recognized that two ladies that were really delivering the bulk of the work um, in that particular department and the team members weren't able to really take leave. They were worried if that team member, you know, something happened to them or they needed to take time off, that everything would just grind to a halt. No one would be servicing the clients uh, and then they would be stuck. So the thought was, Let's go through the systemology process, uh, capture the critical systems, and then we can learn the process, internalize that, identify our systems champion, the person who's really going to drive this forward throughout the organization, and then they can take that and then start working with the other departments to follow through the same process. So that, yeah, g great size firm, um, quite, I mean, each of the department heads had some flexibility to kind of manage their own department as though it were a business. So even though it was part of a larger business, each department really felt like its own little micro business. Uh, and, and then they used the best bits from one department to deploy it into the other others. Interesting. And, it, and it's so relatable, right? If you're listening and you have that team member or two team members that if they were to go on vacation unexpectedly or medical leave or whatever, uh, it would be detrimental to your firm. Or they quit, right? Maybe, you know, in this case, one of these ladies just said, look, I'm done. And they quit. And like out the door goes all the IP, goes all the, all the uh, uh, process and workflow that's been in their brain. So uh, I think it's, it's, you know, big or small, I think everybody can relate to this. So um, when you talk about critical steps as the first step, how many are you really looking for in a typical firm? Yeah, so the first step in the systemology process is the thing that we call the critical client flow. And that's always where I suggest you start. If you can replicate the delivery uh, of the core product or service and have it happen without key person dependency, that ends up being a huge win. So you, you key start off dependency. What do you mean? Uh, like you, uh, you don't, you're not dependent on any particular team member to deliver that core product or service. I see. So it's interchangeable. You at least have some redundancy in your team. Like it, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. not based, it's not based on special skills of one person. Yeah. And, and, and oftentimes uh, when people first start this process, it's the business owner that, that is the key cog. They are the centerpiece everything goes through them. They've built the business up to a certain size and uh, they've, they've managed to have the success they've had by micromanaging and being across everything. And it's funny because then that behavior gets reinforced and now yeah. that's actually what holds them back because they feel like they need to be the knight in shining armor that solves every problem in the business. That's typically the first problem uh, that we see. But over time, as the business grows, it, it then continues. That just gets passed down to other team members. Then you start to have the bookkeeper or you have the salesperson or you have, um, you know, the marketer, the, the person on the team who knows how to do their role really, really well. And they're almost like a little black box. All of the knowledge is mm -hmm. trapped inside them uh, and no one really knows how it's done. So it's, it's identifying where those black boxes are 
making them clear boxes so that you can see into them and actually what's happening and then making sure that you can then plug in a team members underneath them and that that removes key person dependency and there's a lot of benefits that come from that like it'll improve the performance it obviously means that team members can take time off if someone does consider selling i was just actually listening to your a podcast a little bit earlier with a gentleman called Brian, I believe it was, and he was from, uh, it was exit planning. And mm-hmm. it's very much uh, when it comes to selling a business, it's another key reason to systemize because you want to de-risk the, the opportunity for the new acquirer. They want to make sure if they purchase the business, that it continues to operate as though it was operating without the, you know, when the business owner was there, it just needs to continue to operate at that same level. So yeah, it's, it's all about identifying the core systems generally to start off with. It's about 15 to 20 systems uh, that are central. And we'll talk through the critical client flow. I might even do a screen share to show you. Um, But you work on those first, because if you can get that core product or service delivering without key person dependency, then you create something that is very scalable. Mm-hmm. And it's much easier to plug team members in and grow a lot quicker. Yeah, and, it's, and in so many ways, I think it will inform your hiring plan, right? If you're, if you're the person, so you're the owner, your partner, you're the leader, and let's say you're responsible for 50% of the steps or 50% of the flow, right? Well, there's your hiring plan. Systematically start hiring people that you can remove yourself from those steps. And the way you can remove yourself from those steps is to document what you're doing, make sure that you can use that to train new people. And that's how you sort of like break away and allow your firm to breathe a little bit more to, to grow. Yes, exactly right. And it's, it's one of those things where this kind of just answers that first question of where do I get started? That's the, the critical client flow because systemizing your business can f- feel like an overwhelming topic and you don't know where to start. So it's how do we narrow our f- focus down to the 20% that is delivering the 80% of the result? And how do we identify that? And then how do we start to remove the business owner? Like in, in the example of Mulcani and co, we, we didn't want them the, the key department head to be involved even in the creation of those systems and processes. Again, another misconception is that the business owner thinks I'm going to need to be the person that creates all of these systems and processes, but oftentimes they're the worst people in the team to be creating all the systems and processes because they're so busy and that they recognize systems and processes are important, but they're very rarely urgent. So mm-hmm. they just stay on the to-do list and, you know, months and years roll by and they, and they never systemize. So the sooner we can identify those minimum systems and then identify the key team members who have that knowledge, who we can work with to create the systems that preferably aren't the business owner, the sooner you can get this sort of most important task done. Yeah, preferably not the business owner, I think is probably the most eye-opening part of that statement, right? Uh, so the critical client flow, can you, can you walk us through an example of what this looks like? Because I think maybe you probably think a little bit more holistically than maybe some, some firm owners do, right? And what I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll talk through it first so anyone listening to the audio can get out a bit of paper and just follow along. And then Perfect. I'll... I'll swap to a screen share and I'll show Mulcani's uh, work as well. So um, the critical client flow, it's just an A4 bit of paper. So anyone listening can get out an A4 bit of paper and follow along with what I'm going to suggest here. In the top left-hand corner, you just want to write down your target audience. So who is the dream client for you? Who is the customer that pays your advertised prices comes back and works with you and happily refers new business and people that you just enjoy working with. Start off by identifying them. Next, think about the core product or service that is a great starting point for them. What is the first product or service that you might sell to them? Maybe it's an audit. Maybe it's looking over their books or whatever it may be. Think about whatever that first product is that you would sell to that target audience. Then we, we work down the page and it's really just a series of boxes and imagining the linear order that the business and the client goes through from first getting their attention all the way through to delivering that core product or service. So we start off at the top and we think attention. What are some of the ways that you get the attention of your target audience? Maybe a lot of your business comes from referrals. Maybe you do 
Google AdWords, maybe you do SEO, maybe you go speak on stage, maybe you attend different webinars. The first thing that you need to think about is always what you're doing. The, when you do the critical client flow, you, you want to think about not what you would like to do, but what you are doing, because we're just going to capture the pieces that you're doing and it can be quite illuminating to then identify the holes in your business because mm -hmm. you might go, okay, well, I don't really have any lead generation methods or ways to grab people's attention. Well, that might give you an indication why you don't have enough leads. You don't have consistent ways that you're lead generating. So we start at the top of the page. These are just boxes. You write one or two word answers in them and then you move down. So underneath attention, the next one down we want to think about is the inquiry. How do you respond when your inquiry comes in, you know, in, and how do inquiries come in? Maybe it's by phone, by email, um, maybe it's through the website. You, you think about what that might look like. Then next rung down, how do you then uh, have a sales process or what happens next? Do you have a discovery meeting with them? Do you then after that issue a proposal and have some sort of follow-up? Just think a little bit about what your sales sequence looks like. Again, these are just boxes and these are, you know, one or two word responses in each one of the boxes. Once the person and they stick up their hand and say, I'd love to be a client of yours. How do you take uh, the money at that point? Do you do, do you invoice up front or is it 50, 50 or, you know, do it, do it all at the end. Just have a think about that. Then the next one down, how do you onboard the client? So that would be thinking in terms of, um, do you get them to fill out a questionnaire? How do you make sure that you've got access to the right um, logins for their MYOB or zero or whatever it may be? Um, how do you set them up inside your Jetpack account? and making sure that you get all the data that you need in to manage that client inside Jetpack. Uh, then we move uh, down to the next box down is the delivery, which is the doing of the work. Um, what are those key steps for the way that you extract the data and then start to do your analysis? And then finally, what does the handover and, and repeating look like? What, what do you do to get them to come back? Uh, and also, you know, on sell them and then encourage them to, to refer other business to you. But if you think about that, that right there, it's a, a one pager from the top to bottom that uh, does a great job at identifying only the critical systems required to deliver the core product or service from both the client's perspective and also the business's perspective from a delivery point of view. And if you just start there, you a few things will happen. One, you'll identify holes in your business. You'll go, oh, I always seem to have these problems where clients are following me up every second week saying, Oh, where are you going? You know, where are you up to with my project? I haven't had any updates. And they're those annoying clients that are always chasing you up. Well, you might not have an onboarding uh, system that sets the expectation that lets them know, Hey, they need to leave you alone for two weeks while you do the number crunching and then you'll follow them up. So, or you might think, Oh, I, I'm getting good leads, but I'm just not still getting enough people over the line. Well, maybe you don't have a sales process. So, so once you've got the critical client flow down, the other thing that you can do to even narrow your focus further is think about the problems that you're having in the business and then zoom into the part of the critical client flow that addresses that area. And that can be a great place to start. So I can do a share screen, but um, was that clear for you, Dave? Yeah, absolutely. And in, in each one of those parts, um, to help me visualize it, is, is each one have like a five to 20 checklist of like how you answer the phone, how you onboard a client, how you nurture leads? Is that, you know, kind of a tangible, of course, we'll talk about how you cannot document, how somebody in your team could document, but is that kind of what you're looking for as an end state? Yeah. So, so um, systemology, it's a seven step process. The first step is define, which is mm -hmm. just what we're talking about right now. It's defining those critical ones. Then the next step down is assign. We think who in the team has that knowledge that preferably isn't the business owner. Um, so that way we can work with them to extract it. Then the next step after that is the extraction phase, which speaks exactly to what you're I talking see. about, which is how do we simply get it out of the head of uh, the team member and make it easy for them because not everybody loves writing documentation and creating systems. In fact, most people don't. So we need to make it easy for the team members and the level of detail that you go into will be determined by uh, a few factors. Uh, 
how often you're recruiting for someone to do that, uh, that particular task, how uh, skilled is that particular team member. So oftentimes maybe answering the phones and what to say for an you know, inquiry, you might go into more detail on that system than maybe you'll go into invoicing the client. You know, you might go, hey, invoicing the client is super easy. So just at the start, at least over time, these systems become organic and you add detail and they grow. And whenever someone asks a question, you you build it into the system. But at least initially, I, I try and be guided by some systems will require more detail than others. Sometimes it's a simple checklist. Sometimes it's a detailed step by step. Um, you know, we have a loom and you record it and then you extract out all of the, the minute detail so there can be no confusion. Um, but, but one of the misconceptions, again, and I like to address these in the book, is um, you don't want to systemize like McDonald's. It's funny because that's the, the poster child, the go-to business that everybody thinks about when they think about systemization. They think, right. yeah, I want to be systemized like McDonald's. But, but what most people fail to recognize is, McDonald's has been systemizing for 60 years. And if you're just getting started and you're trying to systemize like they are today, you're setting yourself up for failure. It'd be like going to the Olympics and then competing against someone who's been training their whole life, you know, has an incredible exercise and diet and, you know, they're, they're world-class, they're lean, mean, systemized machines. And here you are this flabby couch potato competitor who is just getting started and you're trying to compete at that Olympic level. Make it very easy for yourself, very simple systems. Think about how McDonald's would have systemized 60 years ago. They just started with very basic stuff. You want to, mm -hmm. uh, part of this process as well, systems aren't a one and done. This is a, a cultural shift in your organization that you're looking at making that changes the way that you uh, look at things and you always look for the systemized solution and it evolves over time. So yeah, you, you, I would start with simple first, I suppose is, is the takeaway there. And when you, when you talk about the, the person, you know, when you get to the extract phase, you know, is it, is it challenging to find the person that, that should be documenting it? Or if you do the critical flow and you say, well, you know, David typically does that task, is it kind of obvious, like, well, let's try to get David to document it? Or, or do you have to do a lot of, like, digging on, like, who should – I mean, what do you typically see? Yeah, so when we get to um, step number two, so after the define, which is the critical client flow, then we move to assign, which is thinking about the team. So the, the first thing that you would – identify there is thinking about the different departments in the business. Um, so I think about sales, marketing, HR, finance, management, um, and depending on the size of the team, sometimes you'll go, oh, there is a department head and they automatically stick out. Sometimes that isn't the case. And you just go, oh, Sally always looks after that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, you start off to go, is, are there any department heads? And I look for what we call knowledgeable workers. So it's the team member who knows how to do something to a great standard. So whenever we do the first level of extraction, we're not looking at having it perfect and we're not optimizing. We're just capturing as it is right now. And who is the best team member who does that <clears throat> to a great standard? And we just look at modeling them. So if, if you can bring everybody who might be average performers up to whoever's doing it best in the group, that's oftentimes that's a huge win. It doesn't need to be the perfect workflow system, you know, that's the most efficient, blah, 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 blah. It's it really just about who does it best? How can we get it out of their brain and then get everybody else to do it? And then how do we make it easy for them? Because usually your best at team members are just as busy as the business owner. Correct. So, so one of the, the key lessons in systemology is uh, that business systemization um, is a, and I've lost you there, Dave. I'm still here. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So one of the key uh, insights from the systemology process is that it's a two person job and you've got the person with the knowledge and then you've got the person who does the documentation. And usually you'll have the person who knows how to do the task. They might record themselves on loom doing the task, or maybe it's a zoom like we are now and they do a share screen um, I've even had cases where something 
couldn't be recorded uh, online. And, and I remember doing some work. It was actually with a, a, a roofing company where they clean roofing gutters and they sent a, um, one of the apprentices out with it wearing a GoPro and he followed one of the main tradespeople around for an entire day recording what he said to clients, oh, interesting. how he filled out the little form, how, how he set up the equipment. Then all of those videos came back and then we chopped them up and they became version one of the systems. So it's if you recognize it's a two person job and the knowledgeable person, all they have to do is show up and do what they're doing and record them when they're doing it like they would normally be doing it, that makes it much easier for them. Not only that, once the person records them and they do documentation, everybody loves to edit. No one likes to work from a blank page. Right. So if you go back to the knowledgeable worker and say, great, here's the bullet points that we extracted from that video, they're much more likely to, to be able to work through it and give feedback. Um, and it's quite rewarding for them to see a great result that they didn't necessarily have to do themselves. Got it. Got it. Well, I know we're going to be butting up against time here in just a couple minutes. Do you have, we promised we'll see the flow for a second. So can you quickly share your screen and for people listening again, this is the flow uh, that David outlined from, you know, your ideal client, your ideal service to how you attract them to, you know, how you contact them, you know, uh, what that looks like. So for people watching on YouTube, where we'll post it up here, you know, you, you, you see this critical client flow, you see the target and customers. I'll yeah. And I can talk through it. So, so there for this particular critical client flow, the target audience was farmers in the ag agricultural space. Um, the main product was a farm management report. Uh, then we start off with different ways that they get attention, things like referrals. A lot of the business comes from partners, uh, obviously posting on their website, they do some blogs and social media. So, so David, to quickly interrupt. So the blog post there, what that would link to is a way to write blog posts. Like there are methods yeah. for writing blog so posts. Is that right? If you can't see the visual, we, as when we first start the process with the critical client flow, as we progress through it, we, we almost have like a color coding system where um, blue is oftentimes things that they're not doing that they would like to be doing more and, and better. Green is, Hey, we have, uh, recorded it and it has been documented uh, and oftentimes orange means it's just been recorded. So looking at the screen, uh, if, if you're looking at it now, you'll see there's a lot of green and then you'll also notice that they are highlighted as a, a clickable link. Those links actually link through to wherever they're storing their systems. We, we use system hub, but it doesn't really matter what platform you use, just wherever you're storing those step-by-step -step how to's and that links through to the process. So the, the critical client flow is a great training tool for when new staff come on board because it helps them to understand how the business works and where they fit into in the entire sequence. But then later on, uh, the way that you would actually use this is and it, looking at the screen, you know, they've listed out contacting how they respond to email and phone calls. They have a step-by-step -step for the in-person meeting, their discovery meeting, how they send their summary email and the proposal the follow-up, how they're invoicing, the onboarding. The delivery is actually, and the reason it's orange is it's the most complex. I, like on this graphic, it just looks like one step, but um, it that particular system links through to a system that's almost like a checklist with multiple steps that needs to happen. And then some of those checklist items actually have complete systems underneath those. It goes one level deeper where it explains how to do that step in even more detail. But the, the way that this works in the real world and where the magic happens is when you combine good processes with something um, like, and I've got it just on, on here, like if, if you compare it, if you add it in and, and you sit it alongside Jetpack, that's where the magic occurs, where you, you assign tasks and then you have links to the system at the point at which the task is being assigned. So when you, when you can do that, then you're assigning a task to a team member, you're outlining what needs to be done by them completing, clicking it as complete. They're effectively saying, I've done it to the appropriate standard. And, and when you do that, that's when you, you watch your, your business really kind of move to that next level. I love it. I love it. And thank you for sharing. And thank you kind of walking through and there's a lot to walk through and I, and I appreciate you giving us a glimpse at your methodology. 
if somebody's listening and you know this really struck a chord and they're ready to go in, they're ready to go all in on systems, what's the best way to, for them to connect with you? Maybe say thank you for coming on the show. I know you have a book, you have a lot of resources. What's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Yeah, so the, the book, it has just come out depending on when you're listening to this, but if you head to systemology.com forward slash book, um, for those of you who do know Michael Gerber, Michael Gerber actually wrote the forward. He called the book extraordinary. Wow. Um, and how'd you get, how'd like, you get, how'd you get him to write the forward? Uh, that's a little bit of a story, uh, in itself. He, um, what ended up happening is he's, uh, have we got a few more minutes and I can tell that story? Sure. Sure. I mean, yeah, we, we got a couple minutes and by the way, I mean, the reason I'm calling it out, right. So Hey, the, the book looks lovely just from the cover, right? So you can tell it's really professionally done. And the fact that, I mean, Michael Gerber is the guy, right? He's the systems guy. He's the e-myth guy. So I think there's probably going to be something to learn about how you got him to write the forward. So I owned a digital agency for about 10 years, uh, got it to a point where I systemized it, stepped out and hired a CEO. Just after I did that, um, I got an email out of the blue from a lady called Luz Delia Gerber. Didn't know the first name, definitely knew the surname. She said, <laughs> call me. And so that's what I did. I picked up the phone and I called her. They were in the um, West coast of the U S I'm in Melbourne, Australia. So my early morning was their afternoon. And she said, oh, look, Michael's just turned 80 and uh, he's written the final book in his E-Myth series called the beyond the E-Myth. And for the first time we've decided not to um, sell, like not to go through a traditional publisher. All of their previous books were through Harper Collins uh, but this time we're going to self-publish because we want to maintain the rights. Michael's getting um, a little bit older and we want to have control over his work. And um, I noticed that you did a, a book launch. She happened to contact me. She had no idea what I was doing with Systemology and System Hub. Um, they, they read my first book, Authority Content. Uh, wow. And she said, I saw the book launch that you did for Authority Content and I loved it. I'd love for you to do that for Michael. Uh, is that something you'd be interested in? And I was a bit sort of gobsmacked and awestruck. I'd, I'd never chatted with Michael before. I was well aware of his work and everything he's done with Emit. Uh, and uh, she said, it's going to take three months. I need to drop, have you drop whatever you're doing right now, work on it full time <laughs> solidly for three months. And I said, um, I'd love to. And then I volunteered for the position. So I did it as an unpaid position just because I thought what a great opportunity to, to work and learn from Michael. Um, and timing wise, it was ideal because literally I just finished systemizing, hired a CEO. Um, so it was a, the biggest test for my business to go, well, could it work without me? So I stepped out, I worked on Michael's book. Um, it ended up becoming a, an Amazon bestseller in 24 hours. I flew to the States um, for the, uh, he had ran one of his last, his last of his events called the Dreaming Room. Mm -hmm. It was in Carlsbad, California. And I attended that workshop and then at the end he was having a two-day mastermind um, to sort of decide the future direction of of his legacy and what they're going to do and they were trying to get uh tony robbins to facilitate that group um but they they didn't end up getting him they didn't have a facilitator at the 11th hour i stuck up my hand and i said uh, i'll facilitate the group if you haven't got anyone and they said yes no worries so here we are in carlsbad california in his presidential suite with the, a group of the who's who all sitting around this mastermind for two days. And I'm up the front facilitating it. Um, and it was at that moment that it kind of made me realize the importance of systems and processes, because that was an absolute epic opportunity for me that just completely fell out of the blue. They didn't have any idea the work I was doing with system hub and systemology. Uh, but most, I realized the only reason I could take advantage of that was because I'd systemized the business. Most business owners, if you had your industry expert, your expert, like your Oprah, knock on your door and say, I'd love to work with you. Most business owners would go, hey, I'm too busy. I can't yeah. step away. My business would crash and burn. So I... I I had the opportunity fall in my lap. I took advantage of it. I've worked with Michael and now I've worked with Michael on numerous different projects. It all spawned from that one thing. Um, he, I, I, I then let him know shortly after that, the work that I was doing. And cause I feel like it's a real extension for a lot of the work that he's doing. Um, so we've kind of just started working on projects now and, um, yeah, he, he wrote the forward. It's uh, it was very kind of him to do. And I kind of tell that story that's in chapter one of the book. Very, very cool. So sorry to interrupt. I know you're talking about the book. So 
Uh, you're, you're talking about the website. So is that the best place for them to connect? And can you say it one more time? So people go yes. there. Yep. So um, it's systemology.com forward slash book. Um, and from there, they'll get the links through to either any socials or you can head over to Amazon. It's in Kindle, hardback, Audible. Michael read the forward in the Audible as well. And there's a few little Easter eggs through the Audible as well if you're someone who enjoys listening. Amazing. Hey, David, thank you so much for coming on. And if you are running around, skipping around, hopping around, crawling around, rolling around, I don't know what people are doing when they're listening to podcasts, but maybe you're doing one of those things. You couldn't write down everything David had talked about today. Well, everything is going to be linked up at jetpackworkflow.com slash blog, jetpackworkflow.com slash blog. We'll do a thousand plus word write up. We're going to link to his book. We're going to link to the resources he's mentioned. And if you enjoy this interview, please leave a review. And if you really enjoyed it, share it with a firm owner that needs to hear this information. I think we all know somebody that's looking for an edge, looking for a tip, looking for a tactic that could really elevate their firm. And if this landed for you, share it with a firm owner. I'm sure David would appreciate it. And thanks again for coming on. Pleasure. Thank you for having me, Dave. Of course.